So this morning, we are starting a, a month of August series called Plug In. And the thought with myself and the staff is, you know, we, the, the last year has just been tough on all of us. It's been tough on us relationally, and it's been a challenge to, to, to weather this and walk through the last 12 months as a fellowship, as, as a church. And I, and I want to say to you, as, uh, as one of the pastors here at this fellowship, as I look back on the last year, I praise God for you, and I praise God for your faithfulness to your fellowship. I praise God for the way he has been good to us in the last year, year and a half. And I think this would be a great moment to give the Lord a great big applause, huh, guys? God has been good to us. God has been so good to us. Yeah. And, and uh, so as we kind of come through this and we reorient ourselves uh, to being a fellowship, to being a, a community of believers, uh, we thought it would be good to take just three Sundays and just talk about, okay, where are we at as a church and how do we plug in and where are we heading as a fellowship, okay? To, to kind of launch that, I, I want to share with you an experience I had way back in my college days. When I was in college, I, I would travel on Sunday evenings to little country churches in north central Indiana uh, just to preach. These were small churches who, who normally couldn't afford uh, a senior pastor or a pastor at all. And uh, I got a phone call from uh, one of the um, professors at Indiana West and said, hey Dave, I know of a church that would like a, a pastor to come and preach. Would you like a little experience? And I said, sure, you could use that. And so I, I went to a, a, a little church in north central Indiana. The, the church building was huge, but the congregation had kind of dwindled down to about 30 people. And I remember walking into the big back doors of that church, and as I walked into the, the back door of the church, uh, I, I met a lady, very nice lady, and she came up and greeted herself, kind of surprised to see me there. And I said, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm the guest minister, I'm, I'm the guest pastor preaching tonight. She said, oh, that? Okay, you, go see him. And she pointed to a, an older guy over in the other side of the sanctuary, and I walked over and, and I met uh, the, the person who was the chairman of the board, and I come to find out later he was the church boss. And he said, okay, here, here's what we're going to do now. now. Now, give it, I went there thinking I was only going to preach. But I, I got there, and he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. He goes, I need you to lead three songs. I said, do you, have you picked those songs out? He said, no, you, you'll need to pick those out, and we don't have a pianist tonight. Okay, really? Okay, 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 let me grab a, a hymnal, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick something up. You know, I'm trying to make a good first impression. And as I'm walking away, he grabs me by the sleeve, and he says, oh, he says, and we always do an invitational. And I'm like, invitational for who? I mean, what, you're going to leave the squirrels outside to Jesus? I mean, there was nobody in this, in this sanctuary at all. But he said, no, we always do an invitational. So I said, okay, we'll do just as I am. How many thought that was a good pick? Okay, okay, it was a solo is what it was, Okay. <laughs> And so I, I led these three hymns, which, again, those were pretty much solos. And uh, we did the service, and I, I sang just as I am, and we closed. And I, I did that for about three or four Sundays. And um, at about the third or fourth Sunday, I can't remember which one, but third or fourth Sunday, the, the, the church boss came up to me, the chairman of the board, he came up, and he said, after service tonight, m myself and the board would like to meet with you over at my house. I'm like, mm, okay. So, so after church, we, we went over to his home, sat in the living room. There was about eight people there. And uh, the evening started out really good, meaning we had apple pie and ice cream. I remember that. Okay, it started out really good. So apple pie, ice cream, some coffee. And then the, 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 the chairman of the board, he, he began to really make things interesting. He, he began to share um, his heart about the church and where it's at. And I'll never forget this. You know how you get these pictures in your mind? He, he leaned back in a lazy boy recliner, and he says, our church is in trouble. 
He says, the, the church roof is leaking. We can't afford a pastor. Utility bills are rising. The young people left years ago, and church members can't get along. I thought, oh, Lord, what have I gotten into here, man? Okay. And he looked at me. That's a true story. He looked at me and said, would you like to be our next pastor? <laughs> true story. I'm like, well, yeah. Where do I sign up on that one, you know? Holy cow, you know? And, and so, <laughs> you know, I kind of stumbled through an answer that I thought was professional. You know, it was kind of along the line of, hey, man, I'm, I'm trying to knock out a, a degree and family, and I don't know that I could take that on full time. And as I stumbled through this, I, I could tell he wasn't satisfied at all, okay? And, and he said, okay, well, then what would you do with all of these problems? And that's really true story. So he said that to me, and I'll never forget, like, like I was like 25 years old, but I'll never forget, he's, he's got this pipe he's smoking, and he packs this thing full of tobacco, and he starts puffing on this big pipe, and the, like, like the incense fills the room, you know, and, he's, and he just stares at me, and like all eyes are on me. He said, what would you do with these problems? I didn't know what to say, so I said, well, I, the only thing I could think of is I said this. I said, here's what I would do. I would pray. I would really pray. I would recommit to loving God, and I would recommit to loving people. I, I didn't know what else to say. Okay? And I kind of awkwardly excused myself from the evening and wished them the best. Uh, and uh, on the way home, I had one of those very authentic conversations with God that we often or rarely get to as Christians. You know where you just pour out your heart? You know, and you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, it's not, there's nothing rote, there's nothing canned about it. You're just being real with God. And I remember driving home through that um, you know, mid-central Indiana countryside or in the evening, and I poured out my heart to God, and I said, God, I, I've given my life to serve you, and I've given my life to preach the word, and I love the local church, but God, please don't lead me to a church like this. That's, I plead, God, please don't. Please don't, okay? Because I want to give my life to so much more. I, I want to give my life to being a part of a local body of Christ with real people having authentic conversations about God and faith and following Jesus and making a difference in the world that we live in. And if you want to just bless my socks off right now, say amen to that. Uh, I mean, and I think you're there too. I mean, all of us say, you know, when, when it comes to one life I had to live, I've got one life to live, one life to live for God. I don't want to be a part of something that it's just going through the motions or political or just lukewarm. I want to be a part of something that's making a difference in people's lives right now for eternity. And if your heart is where my heart is, um, I, I, want to, I want to say something to you, and I know it's, it's going out on our live stream community right now and it's being videoed, uh, but I want to say something to you and to all of us listening uh, that I think needs to be said in the American church, but it seems like nobody's willing to say it, okay? And, and here's, here's my statement. The church has complicated what Jesus intended to be simple. I mean, I, I've served in the ministry for, for many, many, many years now. I have preached in multiple denominations, in multiple churches. I have taught in all kinds of, of venues. I mean, come on, as a lot of pastors my age, we've been in and seen the kingdom of God in America inside out and upside down, and I'm grieved to tell you that I have more than enough evidence to back up that statement. And, and here's, here's the phenomena. Okay? And it's not just isolated to churches. Okay? The, the, it could be a business, it could be a corporation, it could be a division in a corporation. It, there's, a, a, there's, a, a, there's a dysfunction that could happen if it's a sports team, a local charity. I promise you, if you're a part of any organization, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with a tension between simplicity and complexity. And, and, and let me share the process that happens in churches, sending them downward 
and again, can happen in many organizations. Okay, the process goes something like this. A church will start out with a heart and a passion for God and for people. It often happens around revival. And if that's kind of a new term to you, it, it's, it's an old time, old timer's term for, you know, God came down and God changed our lives and we got on fire for God. Okay? And churches are birthed out of this. And God begins to do great things and God begins to move. But somewhere along the line, somebody says, you know what, it's, things are good, but if we do some processes, some procedures, things could do better. So they, they begin to create all of their bylaws and all of their rules, okay? And that becomes policy. And whenever a church is driven by policy, okay, it creates this kind of procedure and this kind of machine that leads to mediocrity that creates ineffectiveness. And that's why in America, the average church size in America is, is less than 100 people. Okay. America. In the next five years, I'm fearful, unless there's revival in America, we're going to see uh, one of the uh, a phenomenal, discouraging, disheartening truth as many local bodies of Christ go under. It's, it's critical right now that we become and we be the church that God called us to be. And to that, I'm so encouraged by a question that was asked of Jesus in his answer, because I think it gives us great light. So if you have your cell phones out, you have your iPads out, uh, we're going to shoot this on the big screen. The question that came to Jesus was, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And I love this question from this rich young ruler because he was basically saying, look, Jesus, I have found myself in a religious system that is, is being fueled by processes and procedures. It's way so complicated. It's discouraging. It makes no sense to me. So, Jesus, can you please simplify my faith? So he comes to Jesus. He says, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, now what did Jesus do there? Jesus took the religion that the Pharisees had. They'd made it complicated, okay, and he made it simple. I mean, really, really simple. And here was his answer. Go out and love God, and love people. That's it. That's it. it. It's amazingly simple when we leave this place today what our job description is as followers of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Number one, this week, walk with Jesus. Don't walk behind him. Don't get ahead of him. Get beside him. And when he leads and he tugs, he pushes, you obey. Then as you do that, love God for the life you have and all he's blessed you with, and then love people around you. Is that simple or what, guys? Now, here's the big question, though. Jesus said, love God. Okay, how many of us just are challenged and blessed to do that? Can I see your hands? Okay. And then he says, love people. How many say, now, here's a tough one. Come on. Come on, being real, right? Okay. And here's the big question I ask us this morning as a fellowship of believers. Why did Jesus connect the two? Why did he connect the two? Why didn't he just say, just go love God, you'll be fine? Why didn't he just say, just say you, want, you want to simplify your faith, just go out and try to love people for heaven's sakes? But he connected the two. It, love God and love people. Well, we'll try to think about it this way. Let me introduce a, kind of a new thought for some of us, and this is going to need some soak time, but let me introduce this and, I, and try to let it soak in. Think about it this way. Why would God command us not to steal? Because stealing hurts people, and God doesn't want us to hurt people. He wants us to love people. Why did God command us not to lie? Because lying hurts people. 
And God wants us to love people, not hurt people. Okay, so you could follow that train of thinking out for a long way. So every command centered around human behavior is meant to protect our relationship with one another. Okay? And friends, when we protect our relationship with one another, follow me here, we're protecting our relationship with God. Okay? So let me try to simplify this even more. Okay? We're going to shoot this on the big screen. By obeying one command, we are obeying all the commands. Now, I know that's a massive thought, and if, if you grew up in a very traditional church, or you, you view up unchurched, and you're just getting your arms around faith, I realize this is a massive concept. But listen to me. But while you're processing this, this there's a bigger question that begs to be answered, and it's this. In the American church, the question is this. What did our leader Jesus do really well? Okay, just ask that question with me for a moment. What did our leader Jesus do really well here's I'm going to answer it by own question he loved God well by loving people well and he modeled this for us exceptionally well and this is why he established the church the church was established to be the spiritual representation of Jesus physical body on earth so follow my line of thinking here that means that the world should be able to look at the church and say, this church loves God well by loving people well. Are you with me? Okay, let this sink in, guys, because this is major. Okay? If you want to be a part of a fellowship, a movement that says, man, I want to be a part of a movement that loves God. I mean, come on, God is real and God is present. And they realize all that God has done for them in Christ Jesus all that God has blessed them with. I want to be part of a church just in love with God. You can't separate it. you got to love people too because Jesus wouldn't separate it. And Jesus came and said, let me show you how to love God. Love God by loving people. Later, the apostle John would write and he would say this, this is how we know we love the Father, by the way we love one another. And guys, I don't know about you, but in my life, I'm ready to have my faith simplified. Go walk beside Jesus every day. If he says don't, don't. If he says do, you do it. Okay? If he leads, you follow. Go love the Father who gave us Christ and go love people. I know that, that, sounds, um, that sounds really shallow or simple, okay? But, but let me introduce a thought to you now, and we're going to shift gears here. Simple is not shallow. Simple is deep. Simple is not shallow. Simple is deep. Let, let me make a case for that. Quite arguably, arguably, one of the best examples of truth in the Word of God is John 3.16. And we shot it on the big screen. You know the Scripture. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but you will have eternal life. Now, that I believe, and this is just Dave Coleman talking here, I believe that word whoever is the greatest word in the New Testament. That's phenomenal. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's saying whoever. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your ethnic background. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how bad you've sinned doesn't matter your spiritual pedigree or not, whoever, you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven. Now, guys, that's a simple truth. We, we teach it to grade school children in our children's ministries. That's a simple truth. But scholars yet today are still trying to, to get to the depths of all that that truth means. Simple is powerful, but it's not shallow. Okay? So I just beg for us as a church to reorient ourselves back to simplicity that is deep rather than complexity that is often shallow and ineffective. Okay? So let me transition this and talk about the church just a little bit more here. I'm going to shoot a picture up of, of a young man by the name of Naden Corey. This is Naden Corey. 
Okay, Naden Corey is, uh, I think he's 14 years old now. Naden Corey is barely five feet tall, uh, almost maybe close to 100 pounds. His parents were African immigrants, okay? He doesn't have a good command of the English language. All these factors, his size, lack of ability to really command the English language, made him a target for bullying at school, okay? Naden was walking home one day from school when seven high school students jumped him and they beat him up senselessly, okay? They repeatedly punched him, they kicked him in the head, they knocked him unconscious. I mean, he, he could have died. They videoed the entire assault and uploaded it to YouTube for the whole world to see, okay? And this young man spent a lot of time in the hospital. Uh, when he finally got out, a wide receiver by the name of Deason Jackson held a press conference in Naden's honor to recognize his bravery. And he said to him in this press conference, he said, as a fellow citizen of Philadelphia, we want you and I want you to stay here. And then this is what's amazing. And then this, this wide receiver invited the entire offensive line for the Philadelphia Eagles to join him on the platform. Okay, I couldn't find a picture of these guys, but you can imagine these dudes were huge. I mean, they would, they would kill a bear barehanded, okay? These are huge, okay? And what happened next was amazing. Every one of these linemen at the Philadelphia Eagles gave this young man at the, at the press conference their cell phone number and said, you call me if you ever get bullied again. Is that awesome, guys? Is that not rock? Huh? And I, I, love, I love that picture because it's, it's a picture of what the church should be. Every week, we have a community that is being bullied by Satan. Every week, we have families outside of our fellowship and, quite honestly, in our fellowship that is being bullied by Satan. We have young people, we have teens who every week are in a battle for what is good and right and true in their life, and they're being shoved around by a world system in the enemy. And the church should be the place where we wrap our arms around them and around each other, and we say, man, if you need anything this week and you're bullied by the evil one, you call me. I'm on my knees. I'm there for you. You see, we, we've got to come in this simplicity that we're in, come all the way back to simplicity and doctrine, and understand this, guys. Okay? The real enemy is not a political system, it's not the world. The real enemy is Satan. Okay? And he is taking out as many as he can in these last days. I mean, he's got the full court press on right now because he knows his days are limited. And the enemy is Satan, and the real solution is Jesus Christ. Come on, guys. Come on, I, I'm all for all kinds of reform, and I'm all, I'm all for all kinds of, of right government, and I'm all for all kinds of, of right laws written. I'm all for that. But guys... The real solution in our world, in our lives, in our hearts, in our marriages, in our families, the real solution is Jesus. And the vehicle in which we deliver Jesus to the world is the church. That's why we're here, and that's what it's all about. That's why a little over a year ago, we adopted a new mission statement as a group of church leaders that reads like this. Williamson Free Methodist Church it's a church that loves Jesus, makes disciples, and serves our community. You know what excites me about that? A little over a year ago, you guys elected a, a leadership team uh, who have been meeting for a year now. And uh, in the last year, they not only have had a heart for that to put it on paper, but they've had a heart for that to make that happen within this fellowship. I mean, it's written not just with ink, but it's written with our hearts and commitment to Jesus Christ. Okay. But as much as we love God, and as much as we want to do right, follow me on this one, we have to be a church that chooses simplicity over complexity, 
Simplicity over shallowness. And simplicity over, here's the big one, safety. How many of you, come on, let's be real for a moment. How many of you love to play it safe? Can I just see your hands? You just, come on, let's be real. I, I'm kind of wired that way too. I mean, I'm a guy, I mean, I, I build in safety around my life. I've got boundaries around my life. I've got protocols and things I do. And every day, get this, guys, you guys would crack up if you could follow me for a day. Every day, I've got a to-do list. Can I see your hands, how many to-do list? No, it's not a sin. It's not. I've, I've, I've gone for, it's not. And the staff will come in. It's so funny. They'll come in and sit in front of my desk, and we'll be talking. They'll go, Dave, what's your day like? And I'll flip my to-do list around. I'm so proud of it. It's like, dude, is this the coolest to-do list in the world? I, I am so, um, I'm such a safety player and, and trying to be responsible all the time that my family lovingly calls me Mr. Predictable. That's my nickname at home. Okay. Here's the problem. Loving God and truly loving people is never safe. God will call us and lead us beyond safety for the sake of reaching the lost in his name. It's, it's never safe. It always stretches us out of our comfort zone. It always takes us. We, we think in our faith we've gotten this far and we feel good about ourselves, and I love to come this far in my faith and turn around and go, oh, man, look at all I've done. Isn't that awesome? And God says, but don't stop. The just live by faith. You walk by faith. You trust God every day by faith. And when you deeply love God and you say you deeply love people, you get on the edge. You get out there on the end of the branch. That's where the fruit is. And you say, God, for you, I'm going to go for it. And I may look like a fool. This may crash. People may not understand me. But God, this is for you. As I move into my mid-60s, okay, I'll let you guess what age that is, but into my mid-60s, I keep thinking to myself, Dave, burn out. Don't rust out. I give that challenge to all of us, guys. We've got one life to live. We're in the last days. God has blessed us with a phenomenal church here. You guys are awesome. Let's not sit back on our laurels and go, man, we're so cool. Let's get on the edge and let's take our loving for God to the next level this year and our love for people even higher and be the church that God wants us to be. As I, was, um, as I was thinking this through and, and thinking this message through, um, a passage came to mind that, that I want to close as I read to you. It's, it's in 1 Peter 3. So if you brought a Bible or have your smartphone with you, um, I, I think it is such, I mean, it's, it's all Scripture and it's all God-breathed. Uh, but this passage, God's so laid on my heart for these days that we're in right now as followers of Jesus and as a church, and I, I just wanted to, to wrap up reading them to you, okay? Um, it's 1 Peter chapter 3. If you could go down to verse 13, listen to these words from Peter. And by, and by the way, uh, Peter wrote this New Testament letter to a church in a season of the church life called the Dispersia. And, you know, the, the phrase to disperse means, you know, send out, go. It, it actually, in the Greek, there's a meaning to, to go under pressure. And when this was written, Peter wrote this letter, the Christians were being persecuted. They were being persecuted and martyred for their faith, and a lot of them were hiding out in the remote areas of the country. And Peter wrote this letter, and it became a letter that was circulated among small churches and, and small, what today we would call care groups. And Christians would, would meet and a person would show up and say, uh, I've got a letter here from the Apostle Peter and this is what God has said through him. Can you imagine the reverence in which they, they listened to that letter? And this is what Peter wrote to them and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is what God says to us this morning. 1 Peter 3, verse 13. 
Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Let that sink in. Do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep in a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteousness, the righteous and the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Hey, let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word today. God, thank you for the church. God, thank you for your grace to to your church through the ages, the years, and in our fellowship in recent days, God, you've been good to us. When we've been faithless, you've been faithful. When we've sinned, you've been gracious and merciful. When we struggle to find our way, God, you've been there for us in your presence. Father, thank you for a chance, the opportunity to be a witness for you in what could very well be the very last days of the church before you come again. God, would you send your Holy Spirit upon us in a powerful way to draw us back to you. Give us the grace to set you apart in our hearts as Lord. Give us wisdom to have the answers for those who have asked why we have hope in these days. And God, deliver us from fear that we may be bold as a lion, Lord, that we may witness for you and experience all your blessings. And I pray that over this fellowship, that in the days ahead, we would continue to experience your richest blessings in Christ's name.